Gail's Knitting Nest. My name is Julie and this is my nest. First off today I'm going to show you my finished Kiki Mariko rug. Last time I showed it to you it was almost finished and it was humongous so I did eventually get to felting it and finishing it. So here it is I will show you. It turned about out a little bit narrower and a little bit shorter than what I wanted, but it's fine. It fits the space. Next, it's I have it between my bed and the wall, so it's it lies down all along the bed. So when I step out of bed in the morning, I, my bare feet hit this, and it just feels amazing on my bare feet. This wool, once it's felted, it just feels awesome on my bare feet. I, I can't describe it. So it makes me want to walk around on my bare feet. <laughs> also, uh, there's another little rug at the foot of my bed. And after I walk off of this Kiki Mariko onto the other little rug. I can't stand how the little rug feels. So I'm very tempted to make another one, a smaller one, to fit the area at the foot of my bed so that I can walk from felted wool to felted wool and my feet will just be in heaven. So I'll tell you a little bit about the felting process because <laughs> it was kind of interesting. So, um, yeah, it's a huge project, and I wasn't sure how I was going to do it in my washer. Usually I felt in my washing machine, but I didn't have anything large enough to put it into because I didn't want all the wool pieces that come off when you felt to destroy my washer. I thought about maybe putting two pillowcases together or something, but then I had read that a couple people were felting it in the dryer instead of the washer. So what I ended up doing was I filled up my bathtub with hot water and I immersed the rug in the water in the bathtub. I let it sit for about half an hour so it was nice and well soaked. And then I squeezed it out as best I could and I went down to the basement and the thing was dripping wet. So I thought, wow, this is going to take forever in the dryer. So I put it in the washer and put it on a spin cycle. When it came out of the spin cycle, it was, it was all the loose water was gone. It was not dripping anymore. So I threw it in the dryer for an hour on high heat. When I took it out, it looked beautiful, but it was not felted. So I was thinking about, well, why didn't it felt? Now I did know that one person had run it twice through the dryer. So it was either that it just needed another trip or maybe when I put it in the spin cycle, it rinsed out too much of the water. I don't know. So I repeated the process. I soaked it in the bathtub in hot water for half an hour. And this time I tried to wring it out uh, as best I could with my hands and not put it through the spin cycle. So I did that and then I threw it in the washer. I mean, not the washer, the dryer. Did the same thing, dried it for on high heat for an hour. When I took it out this time, it was still very wet. However, it was completely felted as you see it here today. That's the way it looked. Now, I did have a couple issues. As you can see, there is a line down the middle of it and then there's another line right up here along the edge. So that was where it had folded in half so it was a tube right this is where I cut it. It had folded in half on these two lines that you see and it made those lines. So when I cut it open and opened it up, this is the back side. Here, I'll show you that. That's the back side. 
when I opened it up, I could not get rid of these creases. What I ended up doing was I, I did two things. One, I ran it through the dryer again a second time. After, it was still very wet. So I ran it through the dryer again after I, I had cut it open. That was a bad idea because as you can see, uh, or maybe you can, it may be a little hard to see, but there, the edge is kind of scalloped. You see that? It goes down and up and down and up. So the scalloping was exacerbated by the second trip through the dryer. It did, the whole thing did felt a little bit more, but not substantially. And then another effect was one, when I first cut it open, it was a nice straight edge here. And you, you can't really tell because I don't have it lying down on the floor, but the one side didn't felt the same as the other side. So it ended up that one side of it is longer than the other side after the second felting. So when it lies on the floor, it looks cockeyed because it's um, kind of splayed out on the one side to the point where I ended up with kind of a crease in it to, to make it lie, lie sort of flat. Anyway, moral of the story is after you seek it, don't try to felt it again. <laughs> and then the second thing I tried to do was I tried to iron the crease out. So I put it on the ironing board, I put it on high heat with steam, and I pressed hard and I steamed it and steamed it, and basically to no effect. It didn't do anything. So the line is there, and I'm just going to live with it because I really like the rug. It fits my spot almost perfectly. And like I said before, it's amazing on my feet. So I'm just gonna keep it the way it is and maybe make a second one, a smaller rug and learn, use what I have learned from the first one to hopefully make it perfect. So there's my Kiki Mariko rug. Yay. And it was a good stash buster. I can't, I used so much worsted weight yarn from my stash that I might not have enough to do a second rug, which is good and bad because it's good because I used it all up and it's bad because then I can't make my second rug. But I'll see what I can find there. So there it is. I also want to give you an update on my Bray cardigan. Last time I told you that the sleeves were too long and I did fix it, as you can see. Now the sleeves are perfect. I will show you a picture here and look at the cuff in the picture. I ended up fixing the sleeves in a two-step process. As you can see, there are like little circles on each arm. In the first step, I cut off two circles worth of the sleeve, including the cuff. So I cut off like this much. And then I re the cuff. And what you see in the picture here is the result. The sleeve fits okay, but the end of the cuff puffs out at the edge. And I could live with that, but it was annoying. So I did it again. This time I took off one, one more of those circles from there down and then just re-knit the ribbing. Now the inside edge or the inside seam of the sleeve was fine in length. It was only the outside edge where this cable is that it was puckering and making that bulge. So I was trying to figure out, is there a way I can compensate for that? And I did. What I ended up doing was making short rows. Now this will probably be hard for you to see, 
but the ribbing on the outside is shorter than the ribbing on the inside. So I did short rows from the cable around and back and around and back. I ended up doing three sets of short rows, which added six extra rows of length on the inseam than on the outside. So that helped compensate for this puckering of the cable side, and I think it turned out pretty good. It looks kind of weird if you see it in person up close, but for the most part, I think nobody will notice, and it doesn't bother me too much. So I fixed my sleeves, and I'm very happy with that. Next, I'm going to show you a book that I got for Christmas. Here it is, March, and I'm finally getting around to this. Anyway, this is 250 Japanese knitting stitches. It is written by Hitomi Shida and the original is in Japanese. So the English version is translated by a woman named Gail Rehm. R-O-E-H-M. Not sure how to pronounce it, but I'm gonna say Rehm. So Gail Rehm. This is a book full of gorgeous stitches. I'll just give you a couple of highlights that I marked here. So this is kind of an opening page Look at those. Aren't they beautiful? And then the book is divided into sections. The first one is called Open Work Patterns. And each pattern has a picture of a photo of a swatch. And then it has a chart with the pattern. Now this is what makes it great for us English speaking people. Because if this were written out in Japanese, we would never be able to read it. But because it's a chart, you can look at the chart and pretty much guess what it says. Now, of course, there's a chart key, and it explains what all the symbols are. But once you know the symbol, you can read along the chart, and you can do work this even though you don't know Japanese. So that's amazing. The next section is called Overall Patterns. And then we have Pattern Arrangements. I'm not exactly how sure how they divvied these up or what the criteria was, but that's Pattern Arrangements. Then we have Patterns with crossing stitches, which I would just call cables. Patterns with crossing stitches. And these are panel patterns. And here we have what I consider to be the price of admission. This is my most favorite part of the book, which is edgings. Look at these edgings. They're like edgings you haven't seen anywhere else, and they're just gorgeous. And then here at the end of the book is another, just a picture of a bunch of the stitches. I just love this book. I'm not sure how much I'll actually use it, but just paging through it for inspiration is inspiring. So if you're an adventurous knitter or you like to design your own things or throw in a special stitch in uh, an existing pattern, I highly recommend this book. I haven't actually used it yet, but I really uh, like having it on my shelf as a resource. Other stitch pattern dictionaries that I have are the Barbara Walker books. I have three of them. I'm not sure how many there are altogether, but I have three. And then I have one called Alternate, which is uh, stranded patterns, but not your 
typical stranded patterns. I also have a couple of books. I have Alice Stormworth's Starmore's Fair Isle Knitting, which has a section in it of more, your more traditional stranded patterns. And then I think I have another Fair Isle book. Can't remember. Anyway, I have all these resources. I don't use them a huge amount because usually I'm not designing my own stuff, but when I do design my own stuff, it's very handy to have them. What am I working on now? Last time I showed you a swatch for the sweater that I'm going to knit for my daughter. And I'm doing the Vernal Awakening Pullover. It is from the new Interweave Knit Spring 2021. Let me see if I can find the full photo to show you. Here it is. There it is. So I'm working on that and I have finished the front. Here it is. Oh, it's all like tucked together here. So here's the front. It seems seems like it would fit me, but, <laughs> but uh, when I measure it out, it's the correct measurements and I know it would never fit me. It would be like <laughs> anyway, so this is the front. An interesting thing about this is the short rows at the shoulder are much steeper than I would normally do. Usually I would do three sets of short rows, or maybe it's only two. I would divide it into thirds and do one and two. So I just do two sets of short rows. But this one I think had four in it. So it's a much steeper shoulder. You can, you can kind of see it here because the two leaves should be horizontal. And then this uh, slants up on top of it. So I'm interested to see how that comes together when I sew it up. The pattern is worked in the round and I decided to do it flat for a couple of reasons. One is in the round is just a lot of knitting. It's it seems easier to tackle if you can do it in pieces because they're shorter. They don't, you know, each piece doesn't take as long. Another reason is that I don't know. I just find myself preferring to knit flat instead of in the round these days. For a while there I was enjoying working in the round all the time, but I think I just like it better working in pieces. So there we go. I have started on the back and I'm hoping to have it finished by Easter because I think I will see her for Easter. We'll see. That's all I have for you today. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment box and let me know how you're doing. Tell me uh, what you're knitting, if you finished anything. Let me hear from you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.